high pastor is really a very <coughs> pleasant role. It provides an opportunity to go deeply into scripture that otherwise I would not do. But there are shortcomings in this role of supply pastor. <coughs> I was reminded of that the last time I preached, not here, but at another congregation in the area. And following the service, a man who seemed to be a leader in the congregation <coughs> came to me privately in the sacristy, and the first thing, and the only thing, that he wanted to talk about was his daughter, her family, his grandchildren, who would be spending the next two years in the Philippine Islands doing service work for a church there. Obviously, he was concerned most and only about this family member. And that morning, he had Skyped with her. It's a great day, isn't it, that we're living in? He had spoken with his daughter in the Philippine Islands, and she was greatly concerned about the storms, typhoon season storms were battering the island. And very human when it isn't storming. And what he described is his daughter's face coming through on the sky with, in the humidity, great drops of sweat <coughs> rolling down her face this at 8 o'clock in the morning. So that was the man's concern. And my realization is, in some ways it was a reminder that everybody comes to the church with some burden. We all carry something. And yes, we greet each other with great friendliness. And we say, how are you? I am fine. And that is true. But if we are honest, there is also a burden that everyone carries. And so my friend at the other church was merely expressing that that family concern was the greatest concern, and probably through that concern, he would hear everything that was spoken or done that day. So I said the supply pastor has its limitations, and one of those is that I cannot know you like your pastor does. We cannot know your joys and your sorrows, but we know because of our life that you have them and that you are carrying them today as you come to worship. So the question is, as we go deeply into this letter, Paul's letter to the Christians in Galatia, can we lift from that letter, the second chapter in our case, can we lift up some nuggets of God's grace that might help lighten the burden that you and I and all are carrying this morning. First, we'll have a little introduction to the letter, and I recognize this might be repetitious, because you've already started this study of four consecutive Sundays in January, dealing with Paul's letter. The man who writes it, is a person who has experienced a life-changing conversion when the risen Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus. It's a pretty familiar story taken from the book of Acts. And so this man who had been persecuting Christians now has a total turnabout and becomes a tireless missionary, establishing congregations of new Christians across the lands. <coughs> he brought Gentile people together into a relationship with one another and into a relationship with the one he had met on the road, the living, risen Jesus Christ. <coughs> but now, some troublesome people, some troublesome missionaries, and I guess that could go together, have come telling these new Christians, these new believers, that if they are wanting to 
be real Christians, the real faith. It will be necessary for them to practice the laws of ancient Israel. In other words, if you want to be a good Christian, you will have to become a good Jew. Well, Paul would have none of this teaching. He was actually angry about it. As he writes, chapter 2, verse 15, We ourselves are Jews by birth. Yet we know that a person is made right with God, not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So with this introduction to the letter, we return to the second chapter that has been assigned today. Again, we're looking for nuggets of God's grace that might help us to lighten the burden of our time. Chapter 2, verse 16, we have come to believe, we have come to trust in Jesus Christ. It's important, I think, my friends, that we remember what a joy it is to walk daily in faith with our Lord Jesus. I do not take that for granted. This good life that is ours, all a matter of grace, all given to us through our trust in Jesus. However, as good as this life is, and I think we all agree, the Christian also continues to face real challenges kind of things that keep us awake at night, the kinds of things that keep us from sleep. In those times, it seems that our faith in Christ can waver. In fact, it seems sometimes like our faith in Christ completely disappears. The people with deep spiritual wisdom have told us and helped us to understand even the darkness can be a form of light. God, who is great in mercy, knows our needs, knows them better than we know them ourselves. So we don't have to articulate beautiful, well-thought-out prayers. In fact, in time of crisis, we find it is not even possible. We are not able to pray when things are so dark. But our love for God is sufficient. Our love for God is enough. So even our doubts can be a form of prayer. And God who knows our needs, knows them even before we ask, and promises not only to hear, but to act upon our prayers. Chapter 2, verse 19. Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. I think these words show how total and complete was Paul's conversion once he met the living, risen Lord. His entire life was different from that time on. You have known people like this, and I have too. This morning, I am eager to tell you about the faith of a loved one whose name was Barbara Angler. And during our time in Minnesota, we lived there for a number of years as our boys were growing up, the Engler family was a very important part of our lives, and we cherished memories of dinner at the cabin with them, prepared lovingly by Anne's mother. After we moved to Chicago, now some years ago, we of course remained in touch with the Anglers. And so we were saddened to receive the phone call. Barbara was on the line saying, 
I know that you are people who pray, and I'm calling to ask you to pray for me. She had been diagnosed with cancer. At a later time, she called again, and this would happen fairly frequently. This woman of faith was talking about her children, who she was no longer able to be of direct help to because of her condition, because of her disease. But now she said, I simply offer their names up to the crucified and living Christ. I offer them up and turn them over to his care for his help. Well now, years after Barbara has been gone, Anne and I often say to each other in difficult times, let's offer it up. Knowing that there is one who knows more than we do and who can act in our behalf. Offer it up. <coughs> it relieves our anxiety. It lightens the burden. Now in this month of January, your congregation under your pastor's leadership is giving you the opportunity to move more deeply into the letter called Galatians. And the theme for the month of January, recommit. I think it's a vitally important theme in a time when commitment has gone out of favor in our culture. We are told that today there is much interest in spirituality. At the same time, people are very reluctant to commit to an organization or commit to an institution such as the church. It's a real concern. But of course it is the way it is. Martin Luther the reformer of the church, after whom we, in our denomination, take his name, Lutheran. Luther would have had strong words to say against this trend of spirituality apart from organized religion. Luther would have said, whatever life brings, whatever happens in our turbulent world, he or she who would find Christ must first find the church. And by the church, Luther meant the people, the community of faith gathered here this morning on this Sunday. Now I have personally been growing in my appreciation for the local church, the local congregation, even though as a parish pastor, I served as a pastor for many years. Now I'm telling you, in my retirement, as age advances, I'm growing, becoming more and more grateful, more and more appreciative of the local <coughs> congregation. However small, however many problems, <coughs> the church, St. Philip, is the people who are connected to Christ. Christ is the head of the church, to be sure, and you and I, we are members of his body. So when new people see us or are drawn to this place, they are drawn to faith in Christ through us, through you and me, through this local church. Does that sound surprising to you? But Luther would say, he or she who would find Christ must first find the churches. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verse 20. The life I now live in the flesh, live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Have you noticed that the life we are living in the body is winding down? Physically, I am not the man I used to be. Health 
issues, there is less stamina. You see, our human condition does wind down. That is a fact of our life that we ought not to deny. Time is running out. I like and have put it off on this part of a melody from, I think, the 60s. There is no tick-tock in your electric clock. <laughs> but still, our time winds down. But that is not the case in our relationship with Christ. Our time does not wind down with Jesus. That friendship that began so long ago continues to grow and to deepen and to become more real as we age physically. Or as the scripture puts it, heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will not pass away. As an example of this, the body failing, but the spirit being rich and full. And lift up before you today our fellow church member, Irene, one of the oldest members of our congregation. Her children and grandchildren now must bring her to the worship service at Messiah. And when it comes time for the gathering at the table, with her walker, she makes her way forward, painfully slow, step by step. And we wait. Her spirit is willing, but her flesh, her body, is becoming weak. And still she comes in faith, hungry to receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. I believe she is acting out Paul's words to the Christians in Galatia. The life I now live in this aging body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I hope in the midst of all of this, you might have received some nuggets of God's grace that might make your journey just a little lighter. It certainly has happened for me this week, and I'm grateful for that. And I wish you well as you continue through the month of January. Continue in your careful reading of Paul's letter to the Christians.